I've been asked to say a little bit about me during the Grenada Revolution and a little bit about um, the National Women's Organization, women during the revolution, and perhaps some of the challenges that women in Grenada face today. So I can I just get my phone because I've got a quote on that I need. Um, in terms of me, I was 13 when I arrived in Grenada in 1975. And I left there when I was 19, in 1981. So I only had two years of the revolution. As you know, the revolution started in March, the 13th of March, 1979, and ended. There's various views as to when it ended, but the official date is the 25th of October, 1983. My family background in Grenada is a very mixed one in terms of politics. So... They straddled from, and the Grenadians in the room will probably know what this means, so forgive me for those of you who don't, but some were Garyites and some were Blazites. And they certainly weren't radical in any sense of the word. But I did have young cousins who were working with New Jewel and selling the New Jewel paper underground. And I was quite fascinated. Different people who were mixing with different people who were hearing different ideas. The Cubans were there, there was lots of other international workers from Eastern Europe. Both sides of my home, there were Cubans living there, and it was exciting. And then we had Morris Bishop. And for those of you who've heard him speak, you know how charismatic he was and how compelling he was. And so it didn't matter really what sort of family you came from or how much your relatives were telling you this revolution is a bad thing and all these people running around with guns, you know, you were captivated. As a young person, you were captivated. And then the revolution did something quite unique, because what happened, very, very few people in Grenada did A-levels. I think there was less than 100 people each year. It was a very middle-class thing to do. And you did it in the school that you did your O-levels, you know, so it was like 10 of you in each school. Because there were very few secondary schools. We didn't have universal education until the revolution. And the revolution created what was called the Institute for Further Education, which is now TAMCC, although TAMCC is a much different type of organization. But what was in interesting about the Institute for Further Education, and we were, I was in the first cohort of students, it brought all the A-level students in the whole island together. And, you know, you had all these young people with lots of ideas. We were learning about South Africa. We were learning about Palestine. The Nicaraguan Revolution had happened. As I said previously, we had the Cubans. Um, you know, it was a bed of radicalization at that school. And if I look now to my cohort of graduates and what they're doing around the world, one, they're all highly professional people, but more importantly, they've kept the ideals of the revolution alive. So I emailed most of them last night, or some of them last night rather, and those that emailed back, I said, what did the, especially the women, what did the revolution mean to you? Now, I'll probably put that in a paper and circulate it, because I won't have time. But I got this, the most wonderful information back, you know, from somebody who's a banker in Wall Street, an investment banker to boot <laughs> in Wall Street, you know, to a surgeon, people, an ambassador, telling me, that you know, the revolution made them what they are today. And I thought that was really, really quite powerful. That sums up, because later on, you're going to hear my critique of, of the role of women in the revolution, but it sums up that it was an extremely successful um, period for Grenadians, and, and so many of us are a product of that. So we had this Institute for Further Education, and it was a sort of training school I suppose for civil servants, it was going to be the training school for the bureaucracy, and I think if the revolution had lasted, that's probably where we all would have ended up, just being in various roles in government. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. But ours wasn't just a normal education. You weren't just doing your A-levels, but you were in the militia. We were in the National Union of Students. You were in the National Youth Organization. And I don't know how this happened to me, but I was also in the National Women's Organization, because that, that was very uncommon, um, that young people got involved in the National Women's Organization. It was mostly the older, when I say older, you know, I'm talking about I was 16 then, so I'm talking, you know, you're sort of in your, it was people who weren't at school who got involved in 
the National Women's Organization. But for some reason I was in it, and I think I was in it due to a woman called Catherine James um, Selwyn, if you remember her, a sister from our area in Woburn. I'm just trying to turn this off, I do apologize. A sister from Woburn who um, was quite an activist and she made sure everybody got, got involved in it. Um, so so, so that, that's me, and, and as you know now, I'm doing all sorts of things. You know, I'm a lawyer here and in Grenada. I'm very, very involved in mostly asylum and refugee work, although I'm moving into civil liberties work more. And I'm very actively involved in the Windrush struggle and the anti-deportation struggle. And, and I think, you know, that, that, that to me is, because those are really dreadfully paid areas of law to go into. But we work, and my colleague Michelle, who's here too, we work extremely passionately all hours of the day, all hours of the night, you know. And with the recent charter to Jamaica, the deportation charter flight, there were about, I, I didn't have a client on it, but there were a group of about eight lawyers up, did not go to bed all night, working for free, just helping to write bits for other lawyers to put into their reps, because the Home Office were playing all sorts of games and serving decisions at three o'clock in the morning. And I think that that is a tribute to the revolution that, you know, that there are, there are my generation who don't put, you know, entrepreneurship and money first, but we have a sense of commitment and duty to the community. So I'm not going to go into the Grenada Revolution because I can see I've already used up most of my time and I haven't even started my topic yet. So I'm going to skip over very, very quickly. Um, the revolution and just move some slides along and talk about um, what the situation and most of you have heard this story or narrative or whatever we describe it about what the woman's life was like in Grenada previous to the revolution and so without going in I'm just going to do the headings rather than the detail of the headings you know it was characterized obviously it was a patriarchal society it was characterized by sexploitation exploitation, um, you know, women bore the burden of housework in really appalling conditions, you know, standing over the river and, you know, washing clothes and cooking on coal pots and wooden logs. And it was really hard work. Families were big, people had a lot of children. Um, men would often be found in the rum shops or in other es escapades, or certainly where Selwyn and I come from. <laughs> That might be something characteristic of our family. <laughs> but the women's life was a tough, tough life. Unemployment was poor, and, and unemployment was poor across the board. You know, it was, it was, there's class issues. So, you know, men suffered as much because of exploitation, not, you know, not the sex exploitation, but exploitation that occurred across classes and groups. And Grenada wasn't so much characterized, but it has its colorization that, you know, if you're fairer skinned, you know, you're looked upon better and so on. It has, it has that because every society in the Caribbean has it, but it's not a major thing. The major issue is class and it really permeates society. So all people, all, everybody suffered, men and women alike. But obviously, as in any society where everybody's suffering, women are going to suffer more. That's just the way it is. So, you know, there were poor health indicators. Although I read somewhere, and I only read this today, that the National Women's Organization started in 1977, I wondered if that was an error. Because I have um, I certainly wasn't aware of any women's movement prior to the revolution, but I found this somewhere in an, online in what looks like an authoritative source. It wasn't Wikipedia. <laughs> but, um, you know, but, uh, so I stick by there was no women's movement. You know, poor childcare, unequal pay, and no employment safeguards so that you could just be sacked for being pregnant. And so the revolution happened. And there's been a lot of criticism. I remember once having a debate with some very middle class white women, because you know you get thrust into things when you know something historical happens. And so Windrush has happened and I've been thrust into that with no plan to be thrust into anything. Well then the Grenada was invaded and I was thrust into that. So I was going around speaking about you know what had happened. And so you were finding yourself around the table or on platforms like this in all sorts of weird uh, fora that you'd never dreamt if you'd ever be there speaking in, in England and abroad. And so I remember speaking to, I, I, it was an International Women's Day event with women from the GLC. 
And, you know, never, you know, white, highly educated, middle class women are saying to me, well, there was no national women's organisation in Grenada, because what was its view on sexuality and gay rights and abortion and reproductive rights? And so when you look at it in that context, there wasn't a women's movement in that context. But there was a vibrant women's movement. And so you may say, well, this isn't feminism. But there was a vibrant movement of some sort, however you characterize it and whatever ism you want to give it, that saw women's lives improve exponentially. I mean, we created, because I, I, I now gather I've got one minute, <laughs> so we created a women's desk in the Ministry of Education and Youth and Social Affairs. That didn't exist before. There's a whole long list of things which I can email to you, so I'm not going to... But they've given me another two minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to abuse it, don't worry. I'm not going to go back a few slides. Um, the, you know, uh, maternity leave laws. You've heard all of this stuff before, but some of the laws that were really important were things like the anti-sex discrimination laws, because that was a big one. You know, the big massa could just... Women worked in such terrible jobs, you know, hotel kitchens, Selwyn and I are from the Southern Belt. So most women in those areas worked um, you know, servicing tourists, essentially. And every now and again, you just see a woman turn up who said she'd just been sacked by a, a white boss, usually, a white hotel earner. No recompense, no redundancy, no rights whatsoever. So that was made illegal. We, the National Women's Organization uh, was launched. We saw women in high-ranking roles like ambassadors, permanent secretaries, and what was most important about how women benefited, that it permeated every area, so health, education, economy, agriculture, it permeated all of that, and there was long-term planning for how women would benefit, what their gains ought to be, and this was evaluated regularly, because often that doesn't happen. And just very finally, we need to speak about Phyllis Cord. Um, you can't really discuss the Grenada Revolution without recognizing the contribution that Phyllis Cord has made, because particularly there were loads of women, and I've got a whole long list of women I was going to talk about, but th there were so many women who made contributions to the Grenada Revolution. But it is right and fitting that we recognize her because of the price that she paid and the way she has been vilified by people who just choose to vilify without looking into the facts. It's, been, it's such an easy thing to do. I was asked to say a little bit about her, but I'm not going to do that, other than to say that she... Please do say something about Oh, her. right, okay. Well, no, I, I mean about the biography of her, because I'm sure, you know, you know she was born in 1943, graduated from Reading University with a philosophy and English degree, studied here at the LSC and at the University of the West Indies, and became a child guidance team social worker at the London Borough of Warfare Prize. And those, those things are important because Phyllis was, a, was, was the sort of person that made sure that all areas of the revolution were impacted upon by her knowledge. So education, and we, you know, I'm not mentioning her in the context of her husband because that's kind of anti-women to do that, but we all know that her husband wrote that book, How the what was it, the long name, how the British educational system makes British children educationally subnormal, or something like that. But anyway, we know, we, we know he, and, and, and that kind of thinking, so basically, you know, how the racism in the schools affect our children kind of thing. So but that sort of thinking impacted on education and youth planning and policy alongside women's development, but also, also alongside health and social care. And she brought this richness and this vibrancy to it. She was an energetic woman, always running around the place, sometimes exhausting the rest of us. One of the things that I had to do during the revolution on a Sunday morning was take part in a house building program where we went out and helped people who didn't have adequate housing. The Selwyn and so would supply us with materials and we'd be there bagging in nails and, you know, and so on, pretending we were trying to build somebody a house. But it was certainly whatever came of it in the end was certainly better than they had at the start. <laughs> we think, uh, not sure. But uh, <laughs> we found one of them, Selwyn, survived the Hurricane Ivan, actually, wasn't it? <laughs> we must have got something right in the process. But nevertheless, but you know, she would be there. She would be there, and so I do have to defend her. We're not going into what brought down the revolution and all of that, but we're going to celebrate her in terms of the contribution she made 
during those four and a half years, which were incredible and impacted on the lives of so many people. So that when I read all those tributes that came in today, and the amount of people that mentioned her, it was quite heartwarming to the point that I'm actually going to put them together so that people who want them can have them and, and the organization that uh, has put on this event, the for whatever organization can have this information and put it on their website so that, that we can continue the, the, the discussion and we can continue the celebration because time is really short. Um, finally, in terms of women today, I think women in Grenada have gone backwards. I mean, we do see an incredible amount of progress in terms of individuals. So individuals, you know, there are lots of professionals and women don't take nonsense from the men and, you know, there's all that sort of stuff. But, but, but at the same time, globalization or the internationalization of media has had a really negative effect on our women. So when you go to Grenada now, it's very difficult to enter into any serious discourse with women about politics or about anything, really. They're focused on, they've bought some hair. Can you imagine we were revolutionaries and people are buying hair and putting it on their head? Or they're doing, um, you know, nails. That's their focus. Now, I don't care if you want to do those things so long as there's some radical discussion going alongside it. But there's nothing. It's all that. And Grenada's a catwalk at the moment. We have a social economic policy that's based on inward investment and foreign investment from some very <coughs> dubious types. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you know, we've got all these developments, big hotel developments and so forth. And because unemployment is so high again in Grenada, women are becoming prostitutes. Mm -hmm. We have a form of sexploitation. Mm -hmm. My colleague here, who, uh, Sandra, who's very involved with us in our work, I also represent the Grenada Development Network, I should say also, but Sandra does a lot of work and she's very focused on women who are victims of domestic violence and abuse in Grenada and also women who suffer from mental health. And some of the reports that she brings back from her trips to Grenada are staggering. We never saw that even before the revolution. So there's been a setback, but there is something still there. That, that seed is still there. There's a young group of women coming up and they form themselves into something called Groundation. And they're very focused around LGBT rights and domestic violence. But to me, that's a really positive sign for Grenada. That, you know, people are, and, and climate change, that those are the sorts of things that they're picking up on. But if you pick up on something that's around equalities, issues around equalities, you, the thinking will spread. And hopefully, those little seeds that we're beginning to see will lead again to the sorts of conditions in Grenada that we had for women led by Phyllis Cord and other great women. There was Jackie Kreff, you know, there was um, people like Wendy Crawford, Claudette Pitt, uh, so many people, Margot Ogilvy. We need to treasure them all. We need to write about them, and I'd like to get somebody to do that and work with somebody on that. Many women, but today we're saluting Phyllis, and I want to contribute to that salutation. Thank you.